Hey guys, welcome back to episode number two of the Mighty Max build at Man Candy Creations. Today is an exciting day because today I am tearing into the 4G63 motor for a complete rebuild. It's exciting for me anyways because I don't know what I'm doing. Now I've been an automotive technician for over 15 years and in those 15 years I have rebuilt a lot of engines. The problem today is that I'm a Toyota and Lexus specialist. Probably 95% of those engines were all one specific Lexus motor. So when it comes to that motor you could hand me a box of engine parts and I can build you a working motor. Today is a Mitsubishi motor. Other than spark plugs and oil changes I've never touched a Mitsubishi motor. I don't know where things go. I'm terrified I'm not gonna be able to figure out how to put it back together once I tear it apart. Because I value your time, and thanks for watching by the way, uh, I feel like I should mention that my intent for this video is more pure entertainment meets uh, how it's made, rather than a detailed step-by-step -step instruction on building a 4G63. So, if you're building a race 4G63, uh, maybe take what I have to say with a grain of salt, or ignore it entirely. I don't consider myself a hack by any means, but I do know what would slide and what wouldn't on a Lexus motor. So I do expect myself to cut some corners here and there to save some time, more importantly money, and I would not suggest that you do the same. So enough talking, let's go, let's do this. Let's rebuild a motor. Let's start, start the video, come on. photos of me taking photos. It's going to be several weeks until I can put this back together, so these pictures are definitely going to come in handy. This engine had a bunch of external oil leaks, but my main reason for overhauling the whole thing is that it smokes. A lot. Common causes for engine oil smoke are piston rings and valve stem seals, so both of those are definitely getting replaced, as well as all the seals and gaskets involved. Now that the engine's all torn apart, I can inspect everything and see if there's anything else I need to order. The first thing I checked was the condition of the cylinder walls and the block. The crosshatch scratches that you see are actually normal and necessary for proper lubrication and seating of the rings. What you don't want to see, though, is vertical scratches. In my case, I had some vertical scratches, but they were very mild. Next, I checked the pistons themselves. Some very minor vertical scratching on there, too. But if you look really closely, you can see the machining grooves from when the piston is made. And if those grooves are still there, like they are, it shows the piston isn't worn that much. Next was inspecting the rod bearings, and immediately I saw some scratches. That's definite no-no, so those are going to get replaced, as well as the main bearings. Uh, kind of a rule of thumb, if you can feel the scratches with your fingernail, uh, consider replacing those bearings. Fun fact, engine bearings, unlike regular bearings, don't see friction. The way they work is oil gets forced in between the bearing and the polished crank, and the crank rides on that thin film of oil. If you're seeing scratches, either you're getting dirt in your oil, or a loss of oil pressure and you are seeing metal to metal contact. The last thing to inspect, which doesn't really take much inspection at all, is these guys. These are hydraulic lash adjusters or hydraulic lifters. I hear that they get dirty and clogged and cause ticking. Uh, this motor was pretty clean, so I don't think I had an issue with that. My issue was I had a hard time getting these guys out and several of them got damaged. So I'm gonna need to replace those as well. Now here's the fun part. I was planning on using genuine Mitsubishi parts for this entire rebuild. I hear Mitsubishi makes fantastic parts. When they make them. Because apparently they have discontinued a lot of stuff. I couldn't get piston rings. I couldn't get engine bearings. I couldn't get the lash adjusters. All these things have been discontinued. The only thing that I could get from Mitsubishi was the head bolts. In my reading, I found that the head bolts are torqued to yield. 
I needed to get some of those. Torque to yield means that they stretch when you tighten them down. So the ones you take off, you have to throw those away. <sighs> so in my search for parts, I found STM tuned. So far, they've been very helpful in getting me what I need. So some quick details specific to my build. Uh, it doesn't look like anybody's ever been in this motor. So I'm gonna go with all original parts. The original 85 millimeter piston rings, uh, the standard bearings, all that stuff. We're gonna go factory with everything and later on we're gonna plastic gauge and make sure that everything works. This is one of the piston rings. Notice how it's flexible in multiple directions, uh, but only within reason. If you put too much force on it, it's gonna break really easy. Keep that in mind. So when taking off the old piston rings, be very delicate. The old rings don't matter so much, but this is a time to practice. If you can get these on and off without breaking them, you'll have a better chance of not breaking the new ones. And breaking the new ones means more money. What I like to do is starting with the top ring, I find the gap and I push the ring all the way to the right. This will give a little slack on the right side and you can take that right side and flex it up out of the channel. Once that's up and out, you can rotate the entire ring counterclockwise to remove the ring. There's very little flex going on there, just the initial flex getting it out of the channel. Put the ring in, I do the same thing in reverse, starting with the ring on top of the piston, slide it over to the left, drop the left end of the piston ring in the groove, rotate the ring uh, clockwise all the way around until the right end drops in, and you're done. Now, I recommend doing this several times. Just do it over and over and over again until you got it and you'll know. Uh, quick tip, uh, do the lower rings first. The oil ring is very easy to do. Uh, the two top rings are a little more challenging. Those are the ones that you have to worry about breaking. Uh, if you're trying to get a ring over the top of another ring, uh, it's really going to be a pain in the ass. So start with the oil ring. Next, do the second ring down, and then the last ring is going to be the very top one, so you don't have to try to get a ring over an existing ring. Now that you've got that down, you can break one of those rings intentionally and use it as a tool to dig out all the crud that's in the ring grooves. Uh, keep in mind that both ring grooves are different sizes, so you need the correct ring in order to clean it out properly. Once you have the ring grooves cleaned out, you can use either one of those rings to gently scrape out the crud out of the oil ring section, and you're good to go. I had soaked my pistons in carb dip for like eight hours. Uh, after that, I just used a brush and some brake cleaner. Uh, that seemed to clean stuff off really easy on mine. Uh, sometimes this stuff is really a pain in the ass to clean up, but uh, especially the sides of the pistons, you want to make sure that's really clean. And some finishing touches as far as the pistons go. Uh, in the oil groove, you'll notice some tiny little holes. Uh, I get a drill bit that's the same size as those holes to help me drill out the crud that gets jammed in these holes. Uh, keep in mind, I'm not making these holes bigger, so I'm not drilling any metal. Uh, the drill bit is specifically and strictly cleaning out just the oil crud that gets stuck in these holes. Finally, I flushed out all the holes with brake cleaner, and then I noticed that this one hole directly above the piston pin is actually connected to the piston pin. I don't know if this is how the piston pin gets lubricated, uh, because all the other holes just go directly to the inside of the piston and go nowhere. This one's connected, so make sure this one gets clean. Let's talk about cylinder hones really quick. I think I mentioned earlier that my cylinders only have very minor vertical scratching so I don't need to bore them. All I need to do is remove those scratches and reapply the crosshatch. What the crosshatch does is two things, actually. It helps seat the rings and gives something for the oil to grab onto to help keep the cylinders lubricated. Now that the cylinders are done, I can confirm that I got the right piston rings by checking the ring end gap. In order to do that, I'm gonna put it in the cylinder and square it up with an upside down piston. This will line up the ends of the ring so that I can stick a feeler gauge in between the gap and confirm that it's the right size. Ring gap needs to be very precise. Too much gap and you can get blow by, a loss of power and maybe some smoke. Too little gap, when the ring expands with heat, the two ends could butt and cause your piston to seize in the cylinder. I am less than excited to announce that my ring gap is way too big. According to the paperwork that came with my Wiseco piston rings, it says that my gap should be 
0.005 inches. My current gap, 0 0.019. Almost four times more gap than I should have. The thing is, this book says that my 0 0.019 gap is within range. I really don't know what to do. Do I trust the literature that came with the rings? That sounds like what I should probably do. I feel like they know their rings. Or do I just let it go and do what this book says? Honestly, I haven't made up my mind yet. We'll see how STM tuned handles returns or exchanges as far as piston rings go. I don't even know if that's a thing. I don't even know if that's reasonable. Anywho, the show must go on, so I'm gonna move on to the bearings and make sure those are right. And since it's starting to look like maybe somebody has been in this motor after all, uh, I feel like it's time to really start getting strict and checking to make sure all the parts I got are gonna work. So next up, main bearings and rod bearings and plastic gauge. Just like the piston rings, the rod and main bearings need a very specific amount of clearance. Too much clearance and your crank will flop around in the bearings making noise and the oil system won't be able to build enough pressure to lubricate all the parts. Too little clearance, you'll get the metal to metal contact that we were talking about earlier and ultimately engine failure. But because the way the crank and the bearings are designed, we can't use feeler gauges to decide what the clearance is. So instead, we have to use plastic gauge. To prep the engine to use plastic gauge, the bearing saddles need to be absolutely clean. No dirt, no dust, and no lint from towels. So use a lint-free towel to clean off the saddles before putting in the bearings. This will ensure that the bearing is sitting down absolutely flush, and you'll get a good reading from the plastic gauge. Next, without any oil or lube, you're going to very carefully put the crank in place. Keep in mind that there is no lube, so you don't want to turn the crank even a little bit. Plastic gauge is simply a strand of soft plastic of a very specific width. When the bearing cap is installed and tightened down, the plastic gauge gets crushed, and when it gets crushed, it gets wider. The different colors of plastic gauge measure different ranges of clearance. I'm using two different colors at once to try to save myself some time. In order to get a proper reading from the plastic gauge, your bearing caps need to be tightened down to factory spec. Once that's done, you can immediately remove the bolts and check your results. Plastic gauge has the clearance measurements printed right on the package, so you know immediately if your clearance is good. The green side says that I am right within spec, which is between 0 .001 and 0 .002. For giggles, let's check the red side as well. And it says we're right within spec as well. It's a good day. It's a very good day. What do you say we slap some lube on these bearings and install this crank for good? I prefer Redline assembly lube. It's definitely the best assembly lube you're going to find because it's pink. Here I'm installing the thrust bearings and I'm including this clip to show you what not to do. I had never installed these before and this way is pretty much impossible because trying to get the crank on the bearings once they're installed, uh, not easy. And there they go. I learned that you can actually set the crank in place first and then there's enough room to set the thrust bearing against the crank and rotate it in. And then it's the bearing cap that's going to keep the bearing from rotating back out. So we're going to slap a little bit more high performance pink lube on, put the bearing caps on, torque them down, make sure you follow the torque specs and we're good to go. The crank is permanently installed at this point, and it's feeling good to have the first piece assembled. Look at it go. Look at it go. Before I contact STM Tuned about the piston rings, I'm going to check and make sure that I have the right rod bearings by doing the same thing we did before with a plastic gauge. And just as before, make sure that the cam caps are extremely clean and lint and dirt free before putting the bearings on, put the plastic gauge in place and torque everything down to spec. According to the Chilton's manual, the rod bearing clearance needs to be between 0008 inches, that's, that's really small, and 002 uh, using the plastic gauge uh, printed package. Though it's hard to see, is right about 
1.0015. So again, right within spec. Well guys, it looks like this 4G63 rebuild is gonna have to be continued in another video. Not having the right piston rings was definitely a kick in the face, but you know what, I can't complain. When I saw the piston rings were the wrong size, I thought for sure the bearings were going to be too. So it's still a very good day. Unfortunately, I can't go any further on this rebuild until I get those piston rings. So until then, I'm thinking of installing the Eclipse radiator and condenser. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time. Keep moving forward.